our final guest for today, um, probably in my opinion, in terms of a sports celebrity in this country, not just in appearance, but his voice, probably one of the most recognized that we have. And there are some very recognizable ones. So for us to be saying that, that means an awful lot. He is yeah. a former uh, Major League Baseball uh, catcher. Uh, he played uh, with, I believe, Kansas City, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and another stop. And then, and then our Blue Jays. He, he yeah. was a back catcher with the Toronto Blue Jays. He also managed the Toronto Blue Jays. Went on to a, a tremendous career in broadcast both in Canada and the U.S., and is still... Milwaukee broad- Brewers. Milwaukee Brewers. Milwaukee Brewers, thank you. And uh, is still broadcasting to this day. Up in, I was listening to his lovely voice just two days ago. Uh, his name is Buck Martinez. Good morning, Buck. Afternoon, Buck. How are you doing today, fellas? Good to be with you. Yeah. Thank- Hi. Um, so, first of all, you make us look bad now. You're wearing a shirt and tie, so that's... that's i got to go change. Just, uh, the problem- I'm getting ready to go to work. He's got shorts on underneath all that. Don't worry, Hans. He's got all his little cargo shorts on. <laughs> He's in his underwear. <laughs> um, let me just uh, also tell folks that one of the one uh, quality about you that we absolutely love, not that the other things aren't important, but you're a crazy, totally addicted, fanatical angler. And we love you for that, man. That's awesome. Yeah, I am, uh, I'm really into it. And, and I just heard David talk about fishing uh, in Northwest Ontario. And I've done that, uh, been up to Sioux Lookout a few times, been to Chamberlain Narrows a few times. And uh, I love that kind of fishing. And you know, the guy who turned me onto that was Jack Morris. Oh, wow. Jack, of course, uh, from Minneapolis, he would drive up through International Falls and then uh, go into Sioux Lookout and, uh, and fish that great area. And uh, it's, uh, you know, Lock Sioux is a pretty special place to fish. And wow. we, uh, we've had some great trips up there. You know, that's, that's, that's huge as the as the Americans, uh, not just the athletes, all Americans driving through in that area, the Fort Francis area, all that area. And they have such access to Lake of the Woods, Lac Sewell, all these Wabagoon lakes, all these fantastic fisheries. And they can actually drive to it where it takes it's, it's longer for us to drive to it from southern Ontario than it's for a lot of Americans to drive to it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one of our producers here at Sportsnet is from the Sioux. And he would drive up uh, and take him about 20 hours to drive up. And we'd fly to Thunder Bay and take uh, Bearskin Airlines into the Sioux. And uh, we were all set up. It was pretty yeah, awesome. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. For any of the ball players who were avid anglers, you know, being either drafted or traded to uh, the Minnesota area was a great, great bonus, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, at Minnesota with their 10,000 likes, uh, it's just a – an extension of Southern Ontario up there in that great country. It's pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're from California originally, right? Yeah, I'm from Northern California. I grew up uh, salmon and steelhead fishing and trout fishing and bass fishing on Shasta Lake. Ooh, nice. and, uh, then we uh, moved to Sacramento and I got into striper fishing in the Sacramento River. Oh, and we, uh, you know, a big striper uh hatchery out there and uh, we have quite a striper fishery all the way from San Francisco Bay all the way up to uh, Redding on the Sacramento River. Uh, Buck, before we get into all that stuff, I want to talk to you about uh, your background in fishing and, and some great stories I know you've shared with us on the radio show in the past. So, uh, But before we get that, let's just look at the present uh, situation, uh, the the uh, the uh, season uh, that, that is going on with baseball. Of course, uh, you are uh, doing the color on this from a remote location here in Canada to games that are taking place in, for the most, well, not for the most part, in the U.S. and doing it in front of a a screen. And I got to tell you something, Uh, and I'm not a huge uh, baseball viewer, although I will, you know, occasionally watch it. But I got to tell you, the job that you guys are doing, being off location, is blowing my mind. I don't know how you do it. So maybe <laughs> take a minute and just explain how you can make it feel live and that you're there on the field, but you're not. So yeah. tell me about that. Well, we uh, we are in what is called the Tim and Sid studio. And Tim and Sid have a show on the Sportsnet, of course. And uh, they've been kind enough to let us work in their studio. And we have a monitor that I would say is probably 80 inches wide. And that's the one monitor. But then we have several other monitors in the studio that we have the bullpens, the field. We have a simulation of where the defense is set up. We probably have eight or nine different monitors we can look at at one time. 
and uh, we we do our game off the 80 inch monitor. And then for anything that's moving around, we have one or two cameras that we have control of. Our control uh, in the, the director in our control room will have that camera. So if I ask for somebody, if I ask for some player, they will give me that shot. Then we can talk about it. But uh, especially when we're on the road, uh, you know, we're at the mercy of the home broadcast crew because they're the ones that are taking the pictures. Right. Now, in this situation, all across baseball, all the TV crews have been encouraged to do a 50-50 broadcast. So don't take pictures of a home team all the time. You've got to have 50-50 mix with home and visitors. And uh, it's actually worked pretty well. Right. Anybody who hasn't seen Tim and Sid, you got to watch these two guys. They oh. are characters, man. They are funny guys. Just, to, just in case you don't want to uh, on TSN or whatever. You're talking about uh, uh, cameramen and cameras and uh, producers and whatnot. Uh, I think this would be a perfect time for us to tell folks what our connection is with you and how we got to uh, be in touch with you is that we have a, a mutual friend, but uh, a, a co-worker, uh, our very first cameraman on the Fishing Canada show. Uh, his name is Todd Monroe, and you are very familiar with Todd because he's been doing baseball for a number of years, and uh, he actually hooked us up. So, uh, hooray for Todd. Yeah, you know, uh, Todd and I have worked together for a number of years, as you mentioned, and he's our center field camera on a regular broadcast and, uh, you know, very good at what he does, as you guys know. I'm okay. sure he did some great work for you over the years. And uh, But, uh, yeah, Todd and I were sitting around one day uh, – having a beer after a game somewhere, and we started talking about fishing. And he goes, do you like the fish? I said, yeah, I love the fish. And that's how we got involved in that conversation. He said, well, I got to hook you up with Pete and Angelo because uh, they were great guys to work with, and they go fishing all over the place. And it was pretty awesome. Uh, he's, a, he's a great guy. He was our very first official cameraman. Prior to him, we had a camera producer slash producer uh, uh -huh. in the show. And then uh, – we uh, hired a Todd fresh out of school from the East yeah. Coast. It was, so, it was so fun to work with, eh, Todd? He doesn't matter where he went. Way up in Northwest Territories on Great Slave Lake and the worst camp of the world, and Todd just had a great time with it. He just brought our, our spirits up fully, you know what I mean? Good guy. And a great shooter. Great shooter. Yeah, he talked about Great Slave Lake. And, uh, you know, Bear Lake, Slave Lake, those are lakes that I've always uh, thought about fishing. Uh, I've had the chance to fish out west of Campbell River. And uh, I fished for the Taiyi salmon out there, and I've done that a few times. Uh, I haven't fished on the East Coast. Uh, I fished in the East Coast of Jersey, but I fished for tuna. Uh, we caught some swordfish and white marlin about 100 miles off the Jersey shore out mm -hmm. in the canyon. So, uh, yeah, I've been fortunate. I've fished in Costa Rica, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Dominican, oh. the Bahamas, Bermuda. I just caught some Bermuda, uh, some uh, Wahoo in Bermuda last All-Star break. Nice, pretty good trip. Yeah. So, how do you? How does it work? So, you're you're. Let's let's talk about when you were when you were a player. Um, how did you manage to to get away and go fishing? And more importantly, did you tell people that you were into fishing? And I, I, because and, and I bring that question up because there's a lot of closet anglers, and what I mean by that, in their profession, in their in their in their job, they almost don't really want to tell folks that that. They're crazy about fishing. Were you uh, in that uh, in that uh, category, or did you just tell people, "Hey, I'm going fishing today when I'm not playing"? Yeah, no, I told everybody. And my nickname uh, in Milwaukee was Tour Guide because <laughs> I would always put up something to do when we had an off day. And uh, we've done um, well a couple of years ago. Let's see, two years ago we were in Miami, and uh, we took a bunch of our crew and went. Uh, Fish. We caught a bunch of uh, dolphin, dolphin fish. We uh, were off to Miami about four or five miles and caught a bunch of dolphin fish. We took them back to a restaurant and had a big feast for the entire TV crew. Wow. So we've done a lot of things. Justin Smoke and I, two years ago in Colorado, had an off day. We went fly fishing, caught Ooh. some brown trout, caught some rainbow trout. And uh, yeah, I like to fish wherever I get a chance. And I, uh, like I said, I've uh, had a great trip at Los Sueños in Costa Rica. I've caught uh, billfish off the coast of Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Dominican. So right. I've been very lucky. 
Who, and speaking of players, Buck, who is uh, in your mind is maybe the most avid or nut or crazy about fishing of, of all of the big name players? Or there's a few of them, or do you know any that are just saying, I'm just like you did, I'm fishing on my time off? That's it. Is there any players? Yeah. There, there were a lot of guys that I played with that were fishermen. We used to go up to the Lantern Marine on the Severn River and uh, fish for bass. And everybody thought we were crazy because everybody was fishing for pickerel. But we would go up there and literally catch 200, 300 bass in a day. But we had a bunch of Texans. We had a bunch of people from uh, Louisiana and Florida. So everybody knew how to bass fish. Right. So we would catch smallmouth and largemouth bass uh, all up and down the Severn River. And Atlanta Marina was a great place for us. But that was back in the 80s. And uh, I haven't been up there since and haven't done much of that kind of fishing. But... Yeah, Jim Acker, Jimmy Key, uh, Rance Mullinex, Garth Orge, we all would go up there and uh, we'd leave after a ball game, stay overnight, and uh, get up the next morning in the dark. And we knew the place like the back of our hands. So we could dodge the rock piles and the street <laughs> and all of that stuff. So it was pretty cool. Awesome. Is anybody on the Blue Jays roster now that's a crazy fisherman? Is there anybody? Uh, I understand that uh, Daniel Vogelback who they just acquired is a big fisherman. He grew up in Fort Myers, Florida. Right. Where uh, we have a lot of snook and tarpon and redfish and sea trout and all of that. So I'm sure he's a backwater, uh, backcountry uh, snook fisherman because I don't know if you guys have ever caught a snook, but that's to me is the best foot. That's the best fighting fish there is pound for pound. I've heard that. I've heard that. Yeah. I got a lot of kind of It's the same thing. It's just they're nuts. It's like bass fishing. Yeah. You go into the trees and you start pitching top waters into the, you know. You know what? You could use a zero hook under the mangroves and they'll like blow it up. It's, wow. uh, and so, and they'll, get, they'll, they'll get to be 40 inches. And uh, we lost a bunch of them the last couple of years with the red tide. So there's a moratorium on catching them now. We won't be able to catch them until September 21. Uh, catch and keep. Everything's catch and release right now. But another thing not people don't know. They are mighty fine eating. They're right up there with the pickerel. Really? Yeah, they're very good eating. Let me just stop you for a moment because you just said something that's been uh, a word that we've had on our on our minds here for some time since we three weeks ago we we threw open the question walleye or pickerel, and and uh, we've had all kinds of uh, folks weighing in on it. You just said pickerel, which is unusual for an American to call yeah, walleye. Uh, I've been up here since 81, Angelo, so I'm semi-Canadian. So, yeah, <laughs> whenever we go up to the Sioux and fish Lac Sioux, we all talk about pickerel. But, yeah, we call them walleye, of course. I never fished for them before I came to Canada. Wow. Uh, I never, never knew anything about them. But uh, I tell you one thing. There's, there's, no, there's, it's hard to beat a shore lunch with fresh pickerel. It's uh, pretty yeah. awesome. I, I've always said, Buck, if somebody could figure out – how they could bottle that, how they could package that. They'd make a fortune because, yeah. because there is nothing like it on earth. And what's beauty about shore lunch is that it doesn't matter whether you've ever eaten fish or not. It doesn't matter whether you like fish or not. It doesn't matter about any of that. Everybody who's ever sat down to a shore lunch has always had a big smile on their face when they were done and said, this is the best I have ever had in terms of food. Yeah. My, uh, my son did not eat fish at shore lunch at Lac Sioux. Wow. He, uh, he got into fish at that time. He wasn't a big fish eater. And, uh, you know, uh, baked beans, fried potatoes, onions, and uh, some uh, fresh pickle. Pretty good. It's Woo! as good as it gets. There's no – I bet you it's converted a lot of people, your son included. Is it converted a lot? Absolutely. Um, there's, a, there's a question right there from Rodney Sherry Lynn. Buck, what is your favorite fish to, uh, fish, to fish and bait to use? Well, it's, it's uh, the snook. And down in Florida, and um, you know, I just bought a boat in February, so I, I'm just uh, a new boat fisherman. But I've always fished with a lot of friends, and uh, but we like to fish top water for a, a 25, 30 inch snook under the mangroves, and uh, you got to be quick because as soon as they hit it, they're going right back into the mangroves. But uh, that, and uh, I haven't caught one, and we just hung one last year or this spring earlier, uh, Garth Orge was fishing with me and he hung a big tarpon, but we didn't, we didn't hang it on very long, but, uh, that's pretty exciting too. When you see a school of eight or 10 
five, six foot tarpon swinging through your bat bait. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. For folks who've never experienced that, you have no idea uh, the emotions that you go through from that very first split second that you make contact with that fish to the time that you release it or put it in the boat, whatever the case is. People have no idea the emotional um, energy that that goes on inside of you, especially on topwater baits in the mangroves. I yeah. mean, oh my God, it's just incredible. Uh, you know, uh, I know you know this name. Uh, you guys have been in the fishing industry forever, and uh, I had a chance to fish with Jose Wahevi in oh, Costa Rica. The nice. Spanish class. Yeah. Nice. And we uh, we caught sixty four sailfish in three days. <laughs> he, caught, he caught three or four of them on a fly, and oh, it was really, God. really fun to watch. He uh, had the mate bring the teaser in, bring the fish in close enough to get him into casting distance, and then uh, he threw out a big feather and and hung a big sailfish. It was pretty awesome to watch. So how, is he, how is he getting that back cast when, he's, when the boat's trolling that fast? He's got to be like that back cast must be insane. Yeah. He was pretty good, Pete. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. He'd be good. He was oh. pretty good. And uh, he did a lot of roll casting and that, and he could flip it out there pretty good. But we had the uh, the sailfish teased up so close, it was probably about a 20-yard cast. Okay. And uh, at that time, you know, they were in a feeding frenzy. We literally yeah, yeah, yeah. had three on at one time. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> funny. It's funny because I think every great story I hear about bill fishing takes place uh, off of the uh, uh, west coast of uh, Costa Rica. Yeah, I mean, Costa Rica. I, 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 and Panama. Yeah. You know, uh, we, we, we did a similar thing to you. We went out one day and um, we had 21, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Pete, we had 21 fish on camera that we actually hooked up with, but there were more that we, you know, had and, and lost immediately, but 21 that we actually had on camera. And the cameraman was Todd Monroe, as a matter of fact. Yeah, that was Toddy, yeah. 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 Two of those fish were, uh, one was a black marlin, one was a striped marlin as well. Now all the sailfish were on the top of that, but that was yeah. insane. It's, what a uh, Where we were in Los Sueños, you know, they got rooster fish, they got tarpon, they got snook, they got uh, all the billfish <laughs> offshore. But uh, the weather was incredible. I mean, it was uh, like a lake 40 miles offshore. And we saw spinner dolphins and schools of tuna. It was incredible. Nice. But again, speaking of ro rooster fish, have you caught rooster fish on top water no, before? Yeah. That yeah. was I one I have a fish for rooster fish. They look great. Like, they, they look like a fun fish to go for, right? They yeah. just look insane. Like the snook like that, but it's a crazy yeah. version of it. Pretty special fish. Yeah. Uh, Will Wegman wants to know, uh, Buck, uh, do you follow the Bassmaster Elite Series or any of the other professional bass uh, tournament series in the U.S.? Not religiously, but mm -hmm. because we live in Florida, and of course there's so much great bass fishing in Florida, we, uh, we fish a bit. Uh, Garth Orge's grandsons live on a nice little lake not far from our house, so uh, they've caught some eight and nine pounders. Oh. And uh, they they wow. use a lot of rubber lures and a lot of rubber jerk baits and things like that. But uh, yeah, I don't follow the bass fishing like I used to when I lived in Kansas City. Because in oh. Kansas City, of course, we got uh, you know Bull Shoals and Tanicomo and all these great right. lakes in the uh, Arkansas White River area. So there's a lot of bass fishing there too. See, I would have thought in Florida you would have uh, you would have been all over bass down there. I mean, it's just. just it's probably, you know, pound for pound, uh, your best shot at getting a 10-pound bass anywhere in the world. Um, I mean, folks from Texas might argue that. Maybe even folks from California might argue that. But yeah. in, in true, in real fact, Florida is still king when it comes to uh, largemouth and, and yeah. big And California's got Lake Casitas just north of L.A. that has a big uh, history of big bass. And, uh, you know, Okeechobee has got them uh, they're everywhere down there. But there's a lot of... Uh, Little, we're we're not far from Land of Lakes, north of Tampa. Yeah, and, uh, all the way in the middle of that uh, area. There's a lot of smaller lakes that are just loaded with bass. Is, um, Pete, wasn't that where our friend uh, Jimmy Rogers lived? That Land of Lakes area. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and and there's just a tremendous number. Well, every every pothole has has a bass in it. Yeah, uh, 
those pits, those sulfate pits or wherever they were. Remember the strip mines and all that, those strip pits. God, that's, anyway. over, uh, that's over by Lakeland. Yeah. 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 We went in there one time. Uh, there, yeah, that's, if you, you can get in there, man, you can have quite a day. But uh, uh, it was, it was they turned a couple of those into golf courses now and ruined some good fishing. Oh, really? Is that right? Oh, for sure, for sure. If you ever want to get uh, into some of those places, I think we can hook you up. We have a very good friend down there that you might be familiar with. His name is Roland Martin. Oh, yeah. Uh, he um, he can get you into some of those places. So we'll have to we'll have to keep. Might have to get hooked up. Yeah, for sure. Um, what's the weirdest? Okay, before we get to Tim, just hang on to Tim. Leave him up on screen for a second. What's the weirdest situation that you've been in, fishing wise, where somebody has done a double take and said? Wait a minute, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, without question, it was in uh, Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. Nice. Cabo. Uh, myself, my wife, Gary Carter, and his wife were on a princess cruise. And we got off in Cabo and found a small wooden boat with two fishermen in it and hired them. Now, you'll understand how improbable this is. Uh, we went out probably two or three miles, and Gary caught a big sailfish, like a big Pacific sailfish, like 125 pounds. Uh, just by chance, got off the cruise ship, walked down to the harbor, found a boat, said, let's go fishing. And these two guys took us out. And it was they were really good fishermen. It was like uh, chumming for uh, trout in a trout farm. And they had a couple of sails around, and they, they chummed them up, and they had the live bait, and they threw the live bait. And uh, yeah, and then we got back to the dock, and somebody said, aren't you Gary Carter? <laughs> aren't you Buck Martinez? <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty cool moment. Uh, that's hilarious. By the way, by the way, we do that. Uh, we have a fishery here on the east coast of Canada for bluefin, and uh, there's a time oh, of year. It's exciting. There's a time of year where we do exactly what you just talked about, and it coincides with the last day of the uh, herring uh, harvest, uh, the netting of herring. Right. It's the very last day, on the last day, tuna opens. And what happens is the tuna, who have been conditioned to following these fleets of herring boats around because there's free food, every time they bring a net up, thousands of pounds of herring fall overboard right out of the nets and so these tuna are eating them so there's a time of year where if you can you know work it out right you uh you fish adjacent to these these uh, the last day of the harvest for, for herring and you get a bucket of herring and you literally hand feed these fish and and see where the biggest fish is as they come up to the surface to eat incredible experience absolutely breathtaking um but um you're not we, small uh, and like seven hundred, uh, six hundred pounder would be a small oh, yeah. group. It was like massive. We've got we've got so many opportunities here. As 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 you know, they do south of the border. Um, our biggest problem is is our window so short. Sure, this part of the world we have to cram everything into into a short period of time. Um, especially when it comes to the more northern areas. If we talked to Dave McLaughlin few minutes ago from uh, Lodge 88, you know, their window of opportunity is is basically four months. Yeah. And that that's if everything goes well. You know, if they if they have a, a, a recent or a decent ice out early in the year, uh, if, if it prolongs, you know, into a week or two later, their, their window's basically three months, 90 days. They have to do all of their business in 90 days. But having said that, that's why our fishing is so outstanding, right? Yeah. Uh, they're not pressured 12 months of the year. Exactly. Um, and uh, even even things like, uh, and, and I don't know whether you've had this opportunity, but I'll ask you, having spent so much time in Toronto, did you ever think of or have you ever gone fishing in the Toronto Islands? Yes. Oh, you've done it. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, professional salmon, of course. There's big pike around the center. Oh. Big yeah. pike. Yeah. And um, I've fished, uh, I want to say, I'm not sure which river it was. It was out east, maybe 15, 20 miles, and, and caught a bunch of big trout in the spring, big rainbows coming out of the uh, out of the lake. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun. You know, real light line, two pound, four pound line, and leaders, and, uh, you know, little tiny egg balls and uh, yeah, egg sacks. 
probably Ganaraska or Wilmot or the Oshawa Creek, any of those rivers. The Oshawa Creek. It wasn't far. Okay. It probably wasn't far, far. but boy, we got into them one day. And Maybe uh, Duffins, uh, Duffins Creek, any yeah, of those. Duffins and Pickles yeah. would have been, yeah. Yeah, they're all they're all pretty full of bass of trout when you get nice rain. Oh yeah, fresh oh. water goes into the rivers and uh, they run up that stream pretty good. Yeah, now, that would have been freaky for somebody to be walking the Duffins Creek or Yasher Creek area, minding their own business, and all of a sudden this guy comes walking down the path and starts fishing beside you, and you look over and you do a double take and say, "Wait a minute." There's no way. You know, I look a lot different. I got waders on, I got a hat on, I got sunglasses on, and nobody recognizes me. <laughs> and now it's even better. You can put a COVID mask on. Nobody sees anything. All they yeah. see is right there. I, 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 there. I'm going to give you a quick uh, celebrity story that I experienced. And it wasn't fishing, but it, it's very similar to that. So I was in Vegas uh, a few years ago, quite a few years ago. And it's the wee hours of the morning. I get up early, and there's nobody in the, in the casino. I go downstairs to have a coffee, and I'm sitting at this machine by myself. Nobody else around anywhere, right? And I'm, you know, mindlessly playing away and, and sipping my coffee, and, and I'm cognizant of somebody had just come in and sat about, you know, six or maybe seven machines down from me, and I, I'm not even looking, and I'm playing. And after a while, I just glanced over, and I did one of those, and I said to myself, my God. That's Mike Holmes, uh, the famous TV uh, uh, do-it-yourself guy. But I was too embarrassed. And if people don't think that celebrities see other celebrities that they don't know what to do, right? Yeah. I'm too embarrassed to say anything. So I continued playing, and he continued playing. And then at some point, he walked off, and I walked off, and, and never connected. Until about two years later, we're at a, a charity function, and we're at, at the... Um, cocktail area having i'm having a drink and over comes holmes and he says how you doing angelo i said fine uh you know my Holmes. i said well i know who you are and and why not he says you know he says there was a guy in vegas a couple of years ago that i almost went over and said hello to uh, and he looked just like you and it was me <laughs> <laughs> so both of us had that same experience, right? But we're too embarrassed to come over and say, oh, I think most people that would recognize you on the stream or on a lake or whatever would probably be too embarrassed to come over and introduce themselves, I think. You know, uh, I'm going to tell you a quick story. It was a piece of irony because we were up on uh, Lac Sul fishing in a particular small arm of a lake uh, with a guy that uh, was a guide. We'd gone to his lodge and he was taking us up this one special place. And we pulled around the guy and he had a Kansas City Chiefs hat on. And I said, hey, you guys from Kansas City? He goes, hey, you're Buck Martinez. <laughs> In the <laughs> photo of the black school. But he, he was a Chiefs fan and a Royals fan and he happened to be my dentist's father. <laughs> Yeah. No way. Yeah, it was pretty pretty freaky. Uh, I'm up in the middle of a lake in Lac Sewell, you know, 1,500 miles from Kansas City. Yeah, that's wow. always up there. It was a great story. Hey, Buck, do you, uh, do you ever go ice fishing? Uh, have you ever tried ice Ooh. fishing? Do you enjoy ice fishing, if you did? What, what was that? You ever go ice fishing? You ever tried ice no, fishing? No, I haven't. Okay. No, my friends tell me it's quite a, quite a thrill. Uh, Pat Clara who is our director's brother up in the Sioux. He sends me pictures all the time of him fishing in the winter with big uh, lake trout and big northerns and big walleye. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it looks like fun, but it also looks real cold. You know, I live in Florida now, so I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> you got a good excuse, buddy. Uh, Last thing you want to do is leave Florida to go ice fishing. <laughs> <laughs> you just recently bought a boat. What did, what did you get? Uh, oh, the boat, my boat. I got a 27 foot Rabalo center console with twin Yamaha 200s. Oh, that's a nice boat. Yeah, it's a pretty slick boat. And I uh, got it parked in my backyard and got it on a lift. And I can uh, just go outside and jump in my boat and go down the river. Nice. Um, what river are you on, Buck? Where are you? What are you? What, what I'm are you? on the Anclote River, just no. north of uh, the water. Obviously attached to salt. Well, you get up to the ocean from there, I'm assuming, right? I'm assuming with that boat. Yeah, there's there's snook under my dock. We have manatees in the river and there's trout and everything, and we've got eagles and everything. It's beautiful. Very nice. Awesome. 
And I'm only 16 miles from Dunedin Springs Training. Oh, nice. Convenient. Good Speaking of spring training, uh, just just to get back into baseball for just a moment, um, how do you see the the season? Uh, are, you, are you confident that that the pandemic will not hold us back from having a full sixty game season, or do you have any concerns? Uh, what's your views on that? I think everybody has concerns. Uh, you just never know what might strike next, and it's been such a fluid situation. Of course, with the Cardinals in Miami having their big uh, outbreak. And then there have been, uh, you know, the Blue Jays were affected by the Marlins outbreak and uh, the Yankees have been affected by the Mets. And, uh, you know, you just keep your fingers crossed. This last week, there were no positive tests in Major League Baseball. So that's a good sign. And I think most of the teams are doing a great job. And the Blue Jays have been phenomenal in what they've done. From the moment they moved into Rogers Center for summer camp, the, the players have been unified. Uh, they developed their own code of conduct and everybody's following the protocol. And uh, knock on wood, they haven't had any positive tests and they've been able to play whenever they have an opponent that is ready to play. Right. Are you, are you surprised at that with, you know, being such a young team? Are you surprised the way that they've been able to, in my opinion, act so mature uh, yeah. under conditions? Because this is not easy. No, it's not, Angelo. And they're, they're a very mature young group of men and they're, uh, they're very dedicated to winning. You know, they won in the minor leagues. They want to win in the major leagues. And uh, they have uh, done a great job of uh, keeping everybody in line, keeping everybody focused. And, uh, you know, I talk to Charlie Montoyo every day, and he, he, he always sings the praises of his players and how well they have done throughout all of the adversity. First of all, not playing at Rogers Center. Secondly, thought they were going to go to Pittsburgh, and that didn't happen. Then they thought they were going to go to Baltimore. That didn't happen. So they had to end up in Buffalo at Salem Field at uh, the Blue Jays' uh, front office, the the staff did a great job of making Salem Field as Blue Jay uh, branded ballpark as they could make it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not a major league stadium, but uh, they have made it certainly feel like a major league stadium. You know, there's a, a good thing, too, you said about the young people and that. There's a big difference between a professional athlete and young a young bum that's on a in a park drinking beer on the you know uh, on the beach or something like that. They don't really give it. These athletes nowadays, they're very smart people. To get to that spot that they're at, right? They're dedicated. Number one, their whole lives are about that, right? I think every um, buck, I'm sure, included. You're, you're growing up. You're a whole different person. You are you are focused, et cetera, et cetera. So to say, okay, here's the protocol you have to follow in order to keep your game going. They're going to do it. Whereas the average kid out there, he goes, ah, I don't care, let's party, hugs, kisses. You know what I mean? There's a big difference. So, you, you know, know I, um, for s several years, I used to speak to the Canadian Olympic team about making the transition from sports to the business world. And I told them, and they were all like, well, what are we going to do? I've never been trained for anything but sports. And I said, you have an advantage over everybody else because you've always been goal oriented. You've always been focused. That's you've right. always been on time. You have to have a schedule and you have to be dedicated in everything you do to perform at such a high level. Yeah. And all of that translates very well to the business world. And, um, you know, it's very true. I mean, if you get an athlete that is performing on the high level and you want somebody in your company, uh, I would check on an athlete because they are all, goal-oriented, motivated, disciplined, and time-oriented. They, they know that they have a job to do, and they're going to do it to conclusion. Yeah. Hey, Buck, how old were you when you knew you were going to be a professional, not just a ball player, but a professional ball player? Uh, when I signed. That is when I signed, because I, uh, I didn't get drafted out of high school. I went to junior college. Uh, I never thought that I would be a major league player until I signed. And uh, that was that reality. I just played because I loved to play. And uh, at that point, I was pretty good. And I signed with the Philadelphia Phillies in 1967. And uh, that's the first time I ever thought, wow, I'm going to be a professional baseball player. So wow. when you were like 16 years old, let's say, you know, early teens or whatever, you might be, obviously you were playing baseball back then. Not to brag or anything, but did you know you had some – God-given good talent right then and there, and everybody else was saying, oh, my God, this guy's a great player, catcher, whatever position you played, et cetera. Was the, did you know right there that, hey, I might be not too bad at this game? 
No, I, I really didn't, Pete. I, uh, I went to Eugene, Oregon and played my first season. And uh, at one point, I, I was in a little bit of a slump, and I called my dad, and I said, I don't think I can do this. This is, uh, this is harder than I thought. And he said, well, what are you hitting? I said, I'm hitting 324. He said, shut up and get back to playing. <laughs> But yeah, I had, you know, I had done so well as a high school and college player that I thought, you know, that wasn't good enough. But my first year, I hit 357 in uh, rookie league. Oh, no. And, uh, I never had another year like that, obviously. But uh, I learned how to catch in the majors. Uh, it took me about five or six years to really become a major league catcher. And then I was fortunate to play for 17 years. And uh, I was on some pretty good teams. For sure. Um, the the word here in Toronto in this market, and you're familiar with it because you've played here, you've managed here. It's a difficult market to to um, to keep your head on straight because of media, because of the uh, the uh, rabid fans, because 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 it's a different and difficult market to play in. How would you assess both as a former Blue Jay player? and as a manager. Do you agree with that comment or not? Angelo, I've never heard that before. I've never heard that Toronto is a difficult place for a baseball player. It might be a difficult place for a hockey player because okay. everybody is so uh, rabid about the Maple Leafs. But when I first came here in 1981, uh, we weren't very good, but uh, I met uh, Peter Witterington and uh, Peter Hardy, the president of Labatt who yeah. owned the team at the time, and uh, they were very concerned about making the Toronto Blue Jays a first-class operation so players would want to play for the Blue Jays. And uh, they did it from day one. And, uh, you know, Pat Gillick was there. Paul Beeston was there. Bobby Cox became the manager in 82, and the fortunes turned around dramatically. But I have never heard a player that has played here complain about Toronto. Uh, Mark Burley... You remember he got traded from Miami to Toronto, and he came kicking and screaming. Uh, he didn't bring his dogs up. Remember that? He had to yeah. quarantine his dogs. He had a bunch of dogs he wanted to bring up. But by the time he spent three months here, Mark Burley was recruiting players to come to Toronto because he played in Chicago. He was a St. Louis native. And when he played for the White Sox, it took him an hour and a half to get home. When he played for the Blue Jays, he was on his couch in seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that answers my next question. You know, as a manager of the Blue Jays, how difficult was it recruiting players? And it sounds like it was not an issue at all. Now, when you think about the, the great teams in 90, 92, 93, uh, they brought in free agents that you never would have thought of come here. Jack right. Moore came after being the star of the World Series in 91. Yeah, uh, Dave Stewart came here. Dave Winfield. They had David Cohn. They had Ricky Henderson. They had all those guys that were great stars in the states. Clamor to come to Toronto, and they loved it. And, and, and you remember back then, uh, the stadium was full every night, fifty-four thousand oh. people every night. Yep. And uh, it was a it was a rock concert every single night from the yep. moment it opened up in '89 till the players strike in '94. Do you think we'll ever see another Canadian baseball team in the majors again? I think the owners are uh, anxious to uh, expand. And I think Montreal is a team that everybody's talking about. I know Warren Cromartie is involved in the group over there that keeps raising awareness about exposed baseball and wants to bring uh, an exposed team back to Montreal. But, uh, you know, if you were to ask me today, what do I think? I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, Angelo, in yeah. this world. It'd be, nice to see, it'd be nice to see the Expos come back, though. That would be oh, a nice to see again if, if we could. Yeah. But I don't know if it'd be National League or, or you know, American League. Well, at the same time, uh, I think the Blue Jays would be, uh, I guess they would be quasi supportive because they are truly Canada's yeah. team, coast to coast. Right. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. It's uh, it's going to happen. They're going to expand. We'll probably have two more teams in another three or four years. Hey, Buck, I wanted to ask you this earlier, and I said, no, I'm not going to be the one. Somebody will ask, and somebody just bailed me out. Uh, Philip Landry wants to know, he says, please ask Buck in the play which he had his leg broken, 
and still threw out the runner at third base. And did he know that his leg was in fact broken at the time? Yeah. I appreciate the uh, the question, Philip, but actually I threw the ball to left field. I missed third base. Ah. <laughs> and while I, uh, I had tagged out the first runner and uh, I was kind of dizzy, and um, but I knew I was hurt. My leg was numb. It didn't hurt. It wasn't a painful injury, but I knew I couldn't move my leg because my ankle was dislocated and I broke my leg. But I had the ball in my glove and I was scooting around to get in position. I threw the ball past Garth Orge and went down the left field line into the Mariners bullpen. And George Bell picked it up and threw it back. And I caught it on one hop. Uh, it was a 9-2 Seven two double play. Wow! Justin oh. Garfield threw it to me. I threw it to George Bell, who threw it back to me. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and I was sitting on my butt on home plate and tagged out the second run. That is awesome! Oh my god! So was that was that kind of the end of your career? I know you played after that. I came back in one more year, but at that time I was thirty six years old. I was near the end of my career. Uh, what hurt about the injury? that was in 1985 was the fact that I missed the playoffs with the Blue Jays. Right. right. So right. that's the difficult part of it. Cause I, uh, I was on that team and I would have been playing and they had three left-handed starters in the series and I would have played at least three of those games. So that, that who, bugs me. Yeah. Uh, who was the catcher who filled in for you? Well, Ernie Witt was the defensive. He and I were doing, he and I worked together, but they right. brought up a couple more guys after I got hurt. Right. Um, regrets. In terms of uh, your professional career? Yes. I didn't manage like I knew I should have. Wow. Wow. So you can actually think back and say, yes, had I done this? Oh, had I done that? Wow. really? Let me tell you the whole story. Please. Gord Ash hired me. as He was my GM and hired me, and I – signed a four-year contract, and then he got fired at the end of my first season in 2001. So a new general manager came in, and, uh, you know, he didn't uh, – he was uh, of the money ball era, and he thought that everything should be different. And uh, I didn't carry out what I thought was the way to manage a team. That's hmm. all. That's very interesting. I got fired in June, and then I went fishing. <laughs> <laughs> all is well anyways. Okay. Yeah. Uh, speaking of fishing, um, if you, and you can, but if, I'll, I'll just put the if in front of it, if you could put together the ultimate fishing trip and time and money was not an issue, where would it be? And what would it be? It would be... That's a great question. There's so many things I'm thinking about now. Costa Rica, thinking about the Marble Mountains in Northern California. What? It's a wilderness area with uh, one lake in there called the Yukonom Lake, 60 acre lake with brown trout, rainbow trout and Eastern brook trout. And we used to pack horses in there and fish as a kid. It was phenomenal. But if I had my all time Favorite fishing trip, it would probably be on the Miramichi with Ted Williams. Oh, 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 yeah. Wow. No kidding. Yeah. I mean, he was a phenomenal sportsman, and I, I got to know him, of course. He was the manager of the Senators when I first came up, later went to the Texas Rangers. But most importantly, he was a teammate of Bobby Doerr's. And Bobby Doerr was a coach with the Blue Jays when I first got here in 81. Right. And he was from Southern Oregon. And he knew friends of my family that fished for salmon and steelhead on the Rogue River. And they would come down and fish on the Klamath River. And, uh, yeah, Bobby Doerr and I had a lot of talks about Ted Williams. I would have loved to gone fishing with him. Yeah, that would have been an experience, I think, for anybody. Uh, yeah. and, and, and what a backdrop, the Miramichi. Back I don't know. It's his favorite place, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever been there or not. But, um, you know, even if you're not into fishing, standing on, on any of the – the S bends on that river, uh, you feel like you're in a different part of the galaxy. It's it really, uh, really runs through it, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. It's it's the, uh, the thing about Ted is Ted 
was such a sportsman. And, you know, oh. you guys are uh, probably old enough to remember he represented Sears for so long. Yeah. And he had a whole line of guns and baseball equipment, fishing rods, everything was Ted Williams. Yeah. And uh, he went up the Rogue River to fish with Bobby Doerr. And uh, Bobby Doerr always wanted Ted to do a video on hitting. And Ted never wanted to take the time to do a video on hitting because he wanted to fish. Nice. <laughs> nice. So Bobby, Bobby took him out in a drift boat on the Rogue River and threw out an anchor and said, we're not fishing until you tell me <laughs> what you thought of hitting on a video camera. He pulled out a camera and videotaped Ted Williams in the middle of the Rogue River. Wow. Um, yeah. Oh, that's a yeah. great story. Uh, if, if, you get back to normal mm -hmm. in terms of baseball. Um, if you were to get back to normal in terms of baseball next year, because obviously other things are going to happen this year, but if you get back to normal baseball, does that preclude you from going on fishing trips? <laughs> Nothing stops me from going on fishing trips except my wife. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm asking. Here's what I'd like to throw out to you, and you don't have to answer it here, but I I see about three or four people have already mentioned it on uh, on this webcast. Uh, the guest just before you, David McLaughlin, who owns one of the premier, if not the premier operation in Northern Ontario, um, we're going to do a contest with him. We're going to do a, uh, we're going to promote a contest with him to try and drum up. Uh, business back into the north uh, for next season, obviously. Uh -huh. um, I would like to offer to you the opportunity to join us on a trip up there with the uh, folks that uh, we're, we're going to try and put together a trip. Call it a fam trip, call it whatever you want, where That's folks good. buy uh, uh, trips to this place the same time that we go. And I'd like to extend to you. If I don't hear anymore. Okay. I'm in. Perfect. That's what I want. Just give me some notice when it's going to be, and I'll take a week off, and uh, we'll do it. Perfect. I will love it. That's, that's just sweet in the pot. That's beautiful. That is, uh, I noticed some people like asking. They're saying, why don't you invite Buck? Invite Buck. There you go. Uh, that'd just, be awesome. Yeah, that'd be a great trip. trip. I was, I was listening to David and talking about it, and I'm saying, I'm I was writing down the name of his lodge. <laughs> oh, first trip there, Buck, we got uh, we got a ten pound walleye. We got eights. We got sevens. We got. It was like we're in our first trip there. It was insane. It was like the best fishing we've had all the whole season. It was crazy. Yeah, I fished at uh, Laxu Outfitters in Chamberlain Narrows, and yeah. those folks are wonderful. We had some great fishing. My brothers came in from California. They had never done that kind of fishing. My brothers are big bow hunters and outdoorsmen. They hunt ducks right. and geese and everything, and and they fish like crazy. My brother Jeff, my youngest brother, has a, a jet boat, and uh, they fish on the Klamath, and uh, they do a lot right. of red fishing. And my other brother Jerry's got a bass boat, so they fish on the Shasta, on Shasta <laughs> Lake and in Sacramento River. But, uh, they came up, and uh, we had a great trip. We had oh. a great trip. Hey, uh, speaking of jet boats, have you ever gone sturgeon fishing? No, but it's big in Sacramento. Oh, yeah. man. It's big. Uh, they, they, you know, we do the same thing for tarpon. When you're sturgeon fishing, you put out your anchor line and you tie it with a release and a bottle. Right. So when you hook up with a sturgeon or a tarpon, you release your anchor and you have to chase them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you do that with tarpon as well. Yeah, we do that with tarpon too. Uh, what's really cool about uh, about these giant sturgeon uh, that we have on the west coast is that it's more of a hunt than it is a fishery, because uh, since the uh, electronics have become so sophisticated and high tech, what uh, what the uh, operators are doing now they're looking for individual fish and actually being able to determine the size of these fish. Yeah. So if it's these six footers and seven footers. They're apt to just leave them alone and keep going up the river until they see that 10 or 11 or 12 footer. And then they'll position the boat ahead of them, drop the anchor, but they know exactly how much rope they need to let out. And then you feed the line back to where that fish all is right. and all hell breaks loose. You know, I, I've got the Garmin set up in my boat. Oh, I did? Nice. 
and it's uh, you know it's it's taken me several months to really utilize all of the tools it has. Yeah. It's phenomenal. And uh, we do the same thing when we're looking for rock piles and grouper out in the Gulf. And uh, you know the Gulf is pretty flat, but if you find a wreck or a rock pile and it's got the side screen and you can uh, check the bottom out on the side scan and all that stuff. It's uh, it's phenomenal what it does. But yeah, that helps us a lot in the Gulf too. The uh, the depth finders and the chart plotters and all that stuff that we have. And uh, uh, like I said, I, I'm a computer nerd, so it's taken me a little extra time to learn everything that it can offer. But it's been great. That's you know what? That's the key, though. To anybody watching, is what Buck just said there. Just like Buck, just like Angela, just like Pete. It takes time to learn this stuff. They don't expect right. you to look at it and say, there it is, there it is. But take the time. Put that screen on. Sit in your boat and look at it. The saltwater guys, for sure, they sit there. And you and know what? It's so user-friendly. It is so user-friendly. Exactly. So user you yeah. touch a pad. You touch a thing. You expand it. It's it's user-friendly. You just yeah. got to take time to use it. Yep. You know, we're always in such a rush to go fishing. That's it. We don't take time to learn the That's things that are going to help us fish. Exactly. Yeah. And you know what's great about this technology is that you can practice and learn it off the water. If you don't want to take up your time on the water, because people, right. they're limited to how much time they can spend. If you you spend an hour or so every couple of days in your garage or at home and you, wherever you want to do it, these units are built to be worked with off the water to, 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 so that you understand how it flows and you understand how to, how to work them. So my wife has hollered at me many times when I'm sitting up on my boat with the screens on and going, what are you doing out there? <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask you, does your wife fish? She likes to fish. Okay. She, really does. she, she grew up in New Jersey okay. and New Jersey shore. So yeah, she's oh, yeah. been fishing her whole life. Yep. Oh, good. Good. That always helps, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah good. Uh, my good friend Garth Orge and his wife Patty, they're always fishing with us. And Garth's got a flats boat and I got the Rabalo. So he's got a he's got a beaver tail flats boat with a 40 horse Suzuki on it. So we uh we can go in six inches of water and chase the redfish in the in the snook, or we can go out in the Gulf. So we got it covered down there in Florida. You sure do, my friend. You have got it all covered for sure. When um, so when when's your next game? Saturday or or is it tonight? Tonight? Yeah. Oh, you're up tonight. I, I got dressed up. Oh well, there you go. There's an extra bonus. I'm gonna have to. I didn't even know. There you go. So we'll be watching tonight. Um, yeah, we're we're doing a game every day until September 10th. So uh, prediction for the Jays. I need to get the prediction. I think they're going to be in the playoffs. They're uh, they're they're pretty good. They're only two games behind the Yankees right now. Right. Yeah, but it's yeah. the Yankees, right? We know we know all about the Yankees. They play right? they play ten games starting on seventh of September. They play ten games against the Yankees, and that'll determine their fate. Right. Yeah. They they picked up a, a little bit of relief in terms of pitching yesterday. Ron Walker. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he's going to be a starting pitcher, and uh, he should be here. He should be in Buffalo tonight. Okay, so you might pitch in the next couple of days. We sure. might, yeah. Wow, very good. Well, there you go. You heard it here. Buck is saying that the Jays are in. Okay. I'm also saying that I'm going fishing with you guys next year. Oh, buddy. That's, yeah. the, that's the done deal. That's the guaranteed one. I'm not I'm gonna rule out this year, by the way. I wouldn't rule it out yet. So uh we still might get out this year. If nothing else, locally and uh, spend a day on the bow of a boat. I'd love to uh to, to spend some day chasing down fish, whatever it happens to be. That'd be uh, awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Hey, Ange, do we have time for a lightning round with Mr. Buck? I, I think so. I think so. So, Buck, you probably saw on that and last David's last yep. interview, these little quick questions to you, one word answers or whatever like that, as fast as it can go, okay? Sure. I'll, I'll start it out. Which does Buck Martinez like better? Freshwater fishing or saltwater fishing? Uh, saltwater fishing. You never know what you're going to catch. Very you good. Know, it could be like I caught a seven-foot dusky shark in uh, February. You can catch grouper. You can catch mackerel, king mackerel, uh, amberjack, snappers, every, anything. You can catch anything on a given day in the in the ocean. And saltwater fish fight like hell, too. That's for sure, right? They do fight, so... Well, let me throw this one before you, because you just took away one of my questions, by the way. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. You're welcome. As usual, you caught my fish. Okay. Uh, 
if you could only use one of these presentations on whatever species you want to fish for, fly or spin? Spin. Okay. All right. You know what? It's um, I'm about catching a lot of fish. <laughs> ah, are you saying? Yeah, I'm not a classic fire fisherman that says, well, that was really cool. I got a two-pound trout on a six-pound line. No, I'm going to catch as many fish as I can. <laughs> You're the man, buddy. That is hilarious. I agree with you 100%. They, 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 they're, they're a different breed, though, fly fishermen. Oh, my brother Jim. My brother Jim's a fly fisherman, and my other two brothers won't fish with him. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Okay. But do you like catching sharks, or are they a nuisance when you're out in the ocean? They're a nuisance. They yeah. Are. They really are a nuisance because we're fishing for grouper and we're fishing for amberjack. We're fishing down deep, and uh, they're everywhere. Uh, in the Gulf, you know, Gulf of Florida, they're everywhere. We have a lot of bull sharks and dusky sharks and black tip sharks, and there's a lot of sharks around. Yeah, but uh, you know, they're not dangerous or anything. You know, you just get into the boat and you snap the leader and you let them free. And uh, some of them are pretty good eating. I've okay. heard. I would I would never eat a shark. I would never kill a shark. Right, but yeah, I've heard that of nuisances. Go ahead, Ant. Sorry. Yeah. For you then, um, if you could do it all over again, if you could do it all over again, broken leg notwithstanding, if you will, um, would you choose to be a catcher again, or would you pick up another position in baseball? No, I'd be a catcher again. Uh, when you think about it, everybody on the field is focused on the catcher. You get to talk to the batter, you talk to the umpire, you understand. Yeah. That's why so many catchers have been managers because yeah. they are involved in every aspect of the game. You have a pitcher's meeting, the catcher's there. You have a defensive meeting, the catcher's there. Anything involving defense, catcher's always involved. So, yeah, I think that's why so many catchers have been successful managers in their managerial careers because they were always involved in talking about every aspect of the game. Peter? Beauty. Okay, uh, Buck, since you were good, since Buck was good at both of these, I'm going to make it a two-part question because he was a great hitter and a great catcher. What baseball pitch is harder, is hardest for the batter to hit, and which baseball pitch is hardest for the catcher to catch? Ooh. The first one is, without question, a well-placed fastball. Really? Everybody gets away from the fastball. If you throw a fastball consistently and – Juan Marichal was great pitcher for the Giants, and he was uh, a Hall of Famer. Pat Gillick asked him in Cooperstown one time. He said, Juan, how did you have such great control of five pitches? He goes, no. He said, I had about 11 pitches. He goes, 11 pitches? He goes, yeah. Fastball in, fastball away. Fastball in the middle, fastball in the side. Fastball down, fastball here. So there's six different pitches. So if you could master the fastball, it's still the hardest pitch to hit. And the down and away fastball is the hardest because it's the furthest away from a batter's eyes. Right. You have to make a judgment. Is that ball good enough to hit or not? And everybody wants to pitch up. Well, when you think about it, the balls up are right in your eyesight. So, yeah, you might not get to all of them. But when you do, you're going to have a lot of success. So the hardest pitch to catch, yeah. without question, a knuckleball. I was going to ask you that anyways. That was mine. <laughs> I had a knuckleball pitcher in Anaheim, Bruce Del Canton, and Bruce has passed away. And Bruce and I didn't, weren't playing much in 73, and, and we got a start. Jack McKeon put us both in the game against the Angels. Bruce pitched seven innings. I think he had four wild pitches. I had like four pass balls, and they didn't score. They never scored. And about the sixth inning, Don Drysdale's doing the game with uh, Dick Enberg for the Angels. And I heard later on that he said, hey, by about this time, Buck's going to know everybody's name in that front row because he's been back to the backstop all day long. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. That's good. Well, I've got a question. It might not qualify for lighting. Will we ever see another great knuckleballer? Uh, it takes – it takes an unusual set of circumstances. First of all, you have to be a failed conventional pitcher. Right. Wow. Then you have to have enough courage and patience to learn how to throw it. 
and it just takes a combination and, and, and teams aren't patient enough to allow a pitcher to learn how to throw it, you know, because first of all, you don't have a guy that can catch it. When you start throwing a knuckleball, you can't throw it over and it might move a lot, but if it's not a strike, it doesn't make any difference. That's why Hoyt Wilhelm and uh, Joe Necro or Phil Necro and Eddie Fisher and uh, you know, Wilbur Wood, all the great knuckleballers were pretty special because Wilbur Wood actually started a doubleheader one day in Chicago for the White Sox. Started both games. Wow. Wow. Well, did you catch uh, did you catch Dickie? No. Never caught him. Mari had a good knuckleball too. I didn't mean yeah. to admit him, but he had a very good knuckleball. Yeah. No, I didn't. I was well past my prime then. Last last Oh, you got, well, you got one first? Yeah, I'll go first, Inch. What does a 100-mile-an-hour-plus fastball feel like when it hits the catcher's mitt? It's, it's, it's easy to catch. doesn't hurt. It's easy to catch. The harder pitch to catch is a 95-mile-an-hour sinker like Dave Steve used to throw because you have to turn your hand over, and that ball would always land right on your thumb. <laughs> Oh, oh God. If you caught a 100-mile-an-hour fastball, it's rising, and it's like a feather. It's light. But sinker balls are much harder to catch. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Last question. We're going to let you go. I Honest. I'm not going to go back on this. But I have to ask you, and be perfectly honest with us, okay, because it's impossible. Otherwise, you're not even human. You're a superhuman if you tell me that this is not the case. You're known for having – on the spot, instant statistics from every single baseball player that you've ever done commentating and color on. It's just amazing because because you'll come up with the most obscure little stat on everybody, no exceptions. Are those just on the fly, or is somebody writing this stuff for you? No, nobody's ever written anything for me. So 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 how do you know that this guy in 1993 threw you know a no hitter or one one ball shy of a no hitter and the guy on first dropped the ball or you would have had a no hitter like how do you know this stuff Angelo I like my job and I work hard at it <laughs> but I have a I, I have a gift of recall there's no question about that uh, Louis Rivera is um, our third base coach and he's from Puerto Rico and I played in Puerto Rico for four years. And he always marvels at the people I can remember that I played with in 1971. And um, it's just a, a gift I have that I have recollection. But if you talk to a lot of baseball players, they can tell you what pitch they hit in the fourth inning of the Yankee playoff game in 1976. Wow. And uh, just it's just part of what we do. You know, it's funny eh? because – Pete and I are both known in this industry as having, uh, well, not in the industry, in our company, in our business here, amongst our friends, as having a poor memory. We both have, we, if you tell us something, uh, we'll forget it by, by the end of the day. However, however, to a man and to a fish, we can tell you of a particular fish that we caught 20 years ago on an obscure little lake, and we can tell you what bait what size, what depth, what time of day we did it. So I understand what you're saying. It's just one of those things, right? It's your job, and, and that's what we do. We remember fish and presentation. Wow. The three of us are pretty fortunate because we have jobs that we love. That's so right. when you have jobs that you love, uh, everything is good about it, and there's nothing to forget. You remember every day that we are at the ballpark, every day that you're in a boat, every day that you're with your pals fishing. It's pretty special. Uh, and it's a great way to throw this out and say we loved having you on today, man. Awesome, buddy. Awesome. Well, I enjoyed it as well. It's always great to talk to guys that love fishing, that's for sure. Uh, we we uh, we look forward to our get-together. We look forward to getting you out uh, uh, on a boat here locally. We look forward to perhaps getting together with you in northern Ontario uh, with a bunch of, of the uh, fans that are watching today. And uh, more importantly, I look forward to watching tonight. I'm <laughs> sure. Great about that. All Great. right. Well, you guys, uh, I look forward to spending some time with you on the water. That would be a, a fun ex experience for sure. We'll have Thank fun you. for sure. Take care, my friend. We'll Thank talk to you. Thanks, guys. Hey, buddy. Uh, Buck Martinez, does it get any better than that? Oh, yeah. That was a great little show. It was just like we had all kinds of different aspects of fishing, and you ended up with Buck Martinez. Wow.
That was fantastic, buddy. And well done to Jordan and Mike and Sarah and everybody who set the show up, too. Fantastic. Well done. I am so excited about sharing a boat with Buck. Oh, yeah. I think that is the only way it could be better. And I'm already thinking about this, okay? The only way it could be better is to be on a boat with Buck and Roland Martin. That'd be a good one, wouldn't it? Huh? That would be a good one. Uh, maybe that could that would be some fun fishing right there. Old Rolly entertaining us, buck right into it. <laughs> so maybe, so maybe what we do, we we build this contest that we're we're about to unveil. Uh, we give away one of the trips to Lodge eighty eight, right? But we we do a fam trip at the same time where people can buy into that trip. And we, we put celebrities like Buck and maybe Roland there at the same time. That's not bad. We can work on something like that. We can work on that. And we'll throw you and me in just as a bonus. How's that? Yeah, well, they don't even want us now. You're just sweetening the pot so well. They can bowl and buy all the stay home. You're done. <laughs> oh, 